All right, so welcome to another podcast. Uh, today, my guest is Danny Nemu, who has written a really fascinating book, uh, Neuro Apocalypse, which I've been reading. And there's lots of fascinating stuff in there. We talk about um, consciousness and how if you speak Japanese, that's going to alter the way you perceive the world than if you speak English. And autism and savantism and also <clears throat> psychedelic drugs and the Bible. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. No, no cash. Stealing money from the poor's a bit rash Line your pockets, fill your tanks with your rockets Look at it, we just can't stop it Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Just don't be complete That's the only rule Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong I've been going on way too long in why people believe um, certain things rather than other things for forever really um, hmm. going back to school going back to me my university and my academic background is the history and philosophy of science technology and medicine and I was really interested in how people's beliefs change uh, and from there I kind of got into the neuro side of it hmm. uh, how thought works so it started and, with belief you wanted to know why hmm. people believe things yeah why someone would be some religion or why someone would uh what is truth? Those kind of philosophical questions. Yeah, so I'm yeah, yeah. interested in science as a kind of new priestcraft as well. I was always interested in, um, I guess, what, what qualifies as knowledge and why someone believes in one thing or another. Okay. Um, I had a kind of, so I had a background interest in that. Um, I never intended to write a book, though. And when I was, um, gosh, sometime in my mid-20s, uh, I started drinking Daimi which is a form of ayahuasca uh, in yeah, Japan. Yeah. In and, Japan? Um, okay. Yeah, in Japan, yeah. So I was living there. I was living there for six years. And after about a year and a bit, I got introduced to a group there. And so I, so I, I drank that, and it was very um, kind of extraordinary, um, extraordinary stuff. And about a year after that, I had, a, I, I had an interesting experience where um, – I've always been insomniac and my insomnia, hmm. the nature of my insomnia changed. And I found myself, um, I suddenly was seized with an idea and I started hmm. writing it down <laughs> um, very manically one night and then went on uh, for the next, for the rest of that year, just kind of really manically writing these scraps of paper uh, late at night and they all went into a folder and some time later, someone who'd read some other writing, something I'd written on the internet, um, some travel writing, asked if I'd written anything else. And she was the mm. one who helped me kind of work my way through all these bits of paper and organize okay, them. Yeah. All and these the ideas of, around sort of like consciousness and, and all these kind of ideas and then <clears> hone <throat> it into a book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, first it was a question of expanding it out. And then it was a question of kind of cutting mm -hmm. it down. So I so worked on. I want to. I want to just go right in, right into that idea. Like you just kind of, you said. So daime uh, is like an ayahuasca brew. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a particular lineage of um, ayahuasca use. So there's lots of different ways of using ayahuasca from all right. over the Amazon. So is and it like also... I've heard of the Sante daime? That's like Santo a... daime. Yeah. Santo, yeah. So is that the yeah, same just... organization that in Japan that you were working with? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So they, um, there was a Brazilian, a pair of Brazilian guys who um, started a group out there, and that's how I got involved. Yeah, so it's mm. the same, same group. It's a syncretic, um, syncretic way of using ayahuasca in a, let's say, a folk Catholic format. Right. So it's not yeah, it has around. a sort of Christian element to the ceremony. Yeah. So okay, yeah, so that's, that's what right. I was wondering is, so it was actually a Brazilian uh, person who was leading that in Japan. Because I hadn't heard of it yeah. coming from Japan, like ayahuasca use, that's kind of... No, indeed, but it kind of fits quite nicely with the Japanese temperament, because the way mm. that we do it is quite um, quite formal in a way. You know, you're in your certain place, and um, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the ethos of it is about building up stamina and building up strength and staying in your place. So we stamina. don't kind of let it... So stamina, stamina for yeah. enduring the experience? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. staying on your feet, like, um, and dancing all through the night ah, okay. whilst all that stuff's going on in your head. While and the Japanese like that kind oh. of thing. 
But yeah, so you, the Japanese, they like to do things together. They like to do kind of collective rituals mm. um, and they tend to be quite applied. You know, when they get into something, they get really, really into something. Okay, so yeah. you had people going to the trouble of learning Portuguese. And uh, oh, wow. so, yeah, it's not indigenous to Japan, but it did kind of fit in quite nicely. That's pretty cool. Okay. So that was that experience that trigger. I mean, that makes sense, right? Is you have a psychedelic experience that completely alters your perception. And then to think, how does that work? How does that happen? How does my my whole mind get shifted by taking a chemical or something? And then you started just breaking that down. Well, so I was, I was quite familiar with um, psychedelics from beforehand okay. uh, as well. <laughs> and also from meditation and other ways of messing with my head. Mm. Um, I think I think what was quite surprising about the, about the Daimi was it wasn't actually while I was on it and it wasn't while I was reflecting on it. It kind of came out of nowhere. Hmm. Uh, when I was doing something else. In fact, I was at a party when uh, when I got this kind of first, yeah. let's say, insight. And, um, and 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 from that moment on, I used to find myself really being quite antisocial. You know, I've written parts of my book in the toilet at weddings. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I used to moonlight when I had this one job translating in Japan, kind of scribbling away. So it kind of um, it seemed to open a tap hmm. uh, that would, uh, or a dripping tap. I don't know if that's the right, right thing. Right, right. Open a kind of uh, a wound. Um, that would kind of uh, seep ideas into right, my head. Right, maybe planted a seed, as they say. That's a good metaphor, yeah. <laughs> cool. So then, so that's funny to get right into um, that. I think we'll maybe break, get into the psychedelic stuff uh, a little bit afterward and talk about it, you know, in the, the biblical stuff, which you talk about in the book. But before that, I wanted to ask, like, because um, you talk about this in the book, is how does the, how is the Japanese language, how does that, change Japanese people's perspective um, uh, in relation to people who, who speak English? Like, how is that perspective different? Yeah, this is an area which really, really interests me. So a lot of my second book is about linguistics, and one of the chapters is a comparison of Japanese language, uh, the English language, and generally in the European languages, and how that feeds into the psychology of perception and um, the nature of the culture as mm -hmm. well. So um, I guess it's like this, the, the world is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we have certain filters uh, through which it comes into our nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And one of those is um, one of those is linguistic. And um, so if you look at how the Japanese language is constructed or you look at how the English language is constructed and again, getting into the biblical stuff, you look at how Hebrew is constructed, mm. they're all really profoundly different, uh, different on, on a very deep level. Um, so it's not, it's not similar to the differences between, let's say, uh, Italian and English. Um, in Japanese, uh, the, <clears throat> the noun... Mm. is uh isn't given a whole lot of description right so for example in english you might say dog you might say the dog mm -hmm. you might say a dog you might say dogs <laughs> yeah. uh if you say i like dogs uh i like your dog uh i like this dog it's all kind of different in english but basically mm. it's all the same in japanese you say inu ga ski which means dog is likable right mm. so it's not really clear uh without looking at the context, whether you're talking about all dogs or one dog or anything like that. So the language right from the start, well, the, the nouns specifically uh, and the language generally is a whole lot less, um, is a whole lot less uh, defined. Just give me one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear uh, <laughs> something there. Yeah, that was my daughter playing the flute. Um, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so, um, let me give you another example. If you, um, uh, well, another thing is the noun comes first, right? So imagine we're all, we're all sitting around and we're thinking about what we want to have to eat. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to have a pizza, you'd start, you'd start your sentence with, I right. want pizza, right? Uh, yeah. you, so you start, you start your sentence with I, uh, in Japanese, you wouldn't do that. You'd start your sentence with pizza huh. and then you would kind of look around and listen very carefully and you'd see if people were like backing off or if they were sucking their air uh. through their teeth or if they were going high and leaning forward. Uh. And then you start to construct your, you start to construct your, um, your, your idea on the back of this noun that you've already presented. Right. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. 
um, and 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 the, the the verb comes at the end. So it'd be pizza or tabe. That means pizza, uh, and then there's a bit of grammar, and then tabe is about eating. But you don't know if you want to eat it, you don't want to eat it, or we're going to eat it, or mm. you might say, uh, I was thinking about having pizza, but actually I shouldn't have pizza. All of that would come at the end of the sentence rather than, than at the beginning. Right. Um, so so how, how does something like that change people's actual pers- perspective on the world around them and how they relate to people and things? Um, yeah. So if you show a um, an animation of fish in a tank to an American uh, and a Japanese people, mm. they will likely say different things about it. So a Japanese will nearly always say it looks like an aquarium, right? The first thing they will uh. focus on the general uh, rather than the specific, whereas an American will normally say there was a big fish and then he'll go on to describe what the okay. big fish is doing, right? Yeah. The Jap- Japanese will refer to background uh, features and refer to relationships between different features, hmm. whereas the American will tend to focus more on, like I say, what, what the fish is doing. And um, what's really interesting is if you then, uh, like five minutes after the uh, animation has been shown, if you take images of those fish that were in the animation and put them on a different background and show it to the, uh. um, if you show images of the fish on a different background, mm-hmm. it doesn't make any difference to the American. You know, you say, uh. was this fish in the thing? And uh, he will he will say yes or no. Uh. Now, if you show that to a Japanese on a different background, then the Japanese is more likely to make mistakes and also takes longer to retrieve the information huh. of whether it's there. Okay, so yeah, that points to something, yeah, very ingrained then in how we are interpreting well, things. Well, yeah, and it tells us that the, the, the individual is coded along with the context mm. uh, more so uh, in the mind of a Japanese than it is in English. So you can extrapolate out from that and you can look at how the culture works. And the Japanese... If you look at, at, a, at a stone garden, for example, you might be familiar. They often have, will have a big rock mm-hmm. and they'll have lots of pebbles contextualized around it, all kind of, uh, you know, in circles around it. Right. Mm. If you look at um, Japanese art, there's no tradition of still life in Japanese art because things don't really make sense in isolation. They uh, make sense. in context. It's that big. Pro- so in- you know, what? that's funny. What you're saying reminds me of something else in your book. I think we were describing um, autistic people and how they view the world and that uh, an autistic person will take in uh, details before a big picture. And that other people, yeah. you can easily look at like a crowd of people and be like, oh, a crowd of people looking at uh, someone talking to them. And, whereas an autistic person might look at this crowd and say, you know, yellow hair, blue shirt, this guy's tall, this guy's thin, this guy, did it, and you see all these little details before you can extrapolate. And that's all very similar. <clears throat> yeah, indeed. Um, so, uh, I mean, autistic people, are, uh, tend to be overloaded with information. You have yeah. reports of people going to the supermarket and, uh, just having to deal with thousands of prices and all that right. kind of thing. Yeah. So, so, so what English does or Indo-European language is it takes all that information and it systematizes it in a certain way. And then Japanese takes the information and systemizes it in another way. And the knock on effects, uh, go right through the culture. So for example, in Japan, uh, you may have heard that, um, an individual, will only take half of their holiday because they are uh they're kind of linked in a in a very strong way to their context which mm. is their their workplace for example right. if you were to take if you were to take all your holiday you'd be considered selfish <laughs> right and you get right. you get it, you get it in sayings as well that i remember it's when I, I was a school teacher in japan and one of the things that was often said was the nail that sticks out should be hammered down <laughs> right so that's, I mean, that can be interpreted a few different ways, but uh, they're less less focused on, well, you could say being a diff- like a unique individual, a unique snowflake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I mean, um, so in in as a mature person in say England or in the States, you're meant to be independent, and that's right. an example. You know, as a mature person in Japan, you're meant to be in the interdependent. Hmm. It's it yeah, shows that focused on that are, collective and community, which can be a really good thing too, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it can be rather stifling in certain areas. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but you see, all, all through the culture, so like at a drinking party, a Japanese drinking party, you can't fill up your own glass because you look like an alcoholic. You have to fill up other people's glasses. Is that and right? You have to wait. Oh, yeah. that's cool. So wait patiently, and uh, you know, Japanese have different enzymes to me, so they get drunk a whole lot quicker. So uh, I yeah. was often. Um, <laughs> uh, trying to direct the attention of the people around me to my to my empty glass. That's funny, right? Um, so 
one of the areas in the book that was really fascinating on the same line is looking at so there's 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 a whole spectrum of autistic people right some people very high functioning uh, with you know can get can figure out things out socially and everything and some people cannot some people are on a different end of the spectrum and what's cool about it is that some of these people have really high abilities in other areas so you call them like savants or things and there are a few examples one example that stuck out from the book was and you got to tell me if this is even true because i don't like this seemed i don't even know because the example was a guy being able to read two pages of a book at the same time with with either eye at, at the same time is that an actual case uh yeah that's kim peak um so Kim Peake, he wasn't actually autistic. Um, he had something called FG syndrome, mm. uh, which is quite quite similar in a way. But um, the the similarity is that his the way his um, let's say the, the way his neurons work was was highly um, highly diffuse, right? Mm, so diffuse. I'll just explain that a little bit. Um, yeah. With with autism, uh, there's lots of different reasons why people end up autistic. But one of the things which underlines it is is about synaptic pruning. So when you're three. Uh, between the age of say three and sixteen, the number of synapses that you have in your head in your brain is is reduced by about half if you're oh. um, if you're neurotypical. But if you're autistic, it's not. Oh. So what it means is is you have um, one particular neuron will have a big spread of um, of uh, of synapses and connections to other mm-hmm. to other neurons, right? Yeah. Um, now. This is similar for FG syndrome. Kim Peake himself, he didn't have what's called a corpus callosum, which is the which is the bit of the brain which connects the right and left sides uh, 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 hemispheres right. of the brain. And they were operating more independently. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So, so the guy could read, yeah, one page at one page with each eye. That's and, really amazing, um, and, and that's like such an amazing example of how how our physical brain, the the physicality of it, how it's connected or not connected, can really change how we're able to think. It's really an amazing thing. It still it doesn't answer the question of whether consciousness itself is is created from the brain or if it's the brain is more of an antenna for this. Because either way, it could the physicality could ch- still change consciousness. But it's it really is fascinating to look at. Yeah. So so Kim Peake, uh, the way he thinks is uh, the way he thought. He's passed away now. Was also. Um, it was quite incredible, actually. There was a little um, um, a little test done with him. Uh, he was he was played the first uh, few notes of Beethoven's Fifth, which goes mm. da 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 da. Uh, yeah. And he describes his thought process, and so he converted in his mind. He very quickly, very rapidly uh, converted that to dot 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 dash, mm. Mm. which is Morse code for the number five. So it's Morse code for V. The letter V, yeah, which is the Roman numeral for fifth, which and it was Beethoven's fifth oh, symphony. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> so, so with this kind of, you can kind of imagine how the incredibly diffuse uh, network would draw on all these different uh, oh, ideas yes, in the guy's yes. head, and and the guy had you know an unthinkable amount of information in his head because not only could he read one page at a time, but he could remember everything in what he had read for decades, and he you know he used wow. to like going to the um, he used to like going to the theatre, but he had to stop because he would uh, he would uh, correct the actors on stage when they made a mistake because <laughs> he, he had everything coded in his head. So, so that guy um, and uh, autists generally tend to have better uh, memories for lists of words, hmm. which is again quite interesting. So autists don't make categories in the same way, or they, or, or rather right. they don't have um, they don't group things abstract... together as, as in the same way. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because they don't have a, an abstract concept of what the group might be right mm. so uh, um yeah. so so for example um an, an example that um comes to mind is if you read a string of words uh, of sweet things so you read donut mm. and cake uh and um or candy and stuff like that yeah and you intersperse it with other words which are tastes like bitter and sour and um, spicy. Mm. What will normally happen is that um, a person with a, with a neurotypical person, if they're asked to, to um, remember those words and feed them back to you, they will have already grouped in their head sweet things, and they'll right. feed a bunch of them automatically. Back to you. Yeah, because mm. again, because we filter the world through what we've got, you know, and we've already got these these categories. Right. So 
Yeah. Uh, so he fits it. Now, an autistic person um, won't make that mistake. Um, he or she will feed those words back to you. And it's as if the individual detail doesn't get lost in the category. Hmm. Right. So there's a and, benefit and, to it in a way, because you're saying they'll they'll repeat them back in order. Uh, yeah, much more like to repeat them back in order. And mm -hmm. if you ask a, a trick question, which is, is the word sweet in the list? And that doesn't really work in uh, with kind of Canadian um, uh, words. But in English, obviously, sweet means candy is sweet. So yeah. sweet would fit into both categories. So if, mm -hmm. if that test is run, but oh, sweet yeah. isn't in it. And afterwards, you ask you ask the person was sweet on that list. About 99 percent of a, of neurotypical people will say, yes, it was, because it kind of should be there. Right. It's in both right. Categories, they just right? assume it's in that category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, whereas autists won't make that mistake because they don't have the category in the first place, right. or at least, I mean, you do get some high functioning uh, autists who will kind of generate themselves a category. Uh, Temple Grandin, for example, talks mm. about how she had to distinguish between cats and dogs. Mm. Firstly, she distinguished by the size by the size of them, and then her neighbor got a really small dog, and then she had to kind of rejig her category. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. In order to talk about the the nose size. Well, that's pretty um, cool too. Yeah. Like. That that shows that it's um it's different, but it's not necessarily always better or worse. Though you can think differently, and it can be useful in certain circumstances. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And 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 when we talk about savants, in you know, savants are spectacular with their skills. But one in ten autists has heightened skills in some area, which are above which are above average. And that's only the ones that um have been um. Let, let's say that's 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 in a culture where we don't nurture those kind of skills and mm. we don't really and we were still talking about it as a disease and a condition uh, yeah, yeah. and things like that um but yeah i mean spectacular recall um all kinds of skills that come out of the autistic spectrum i was just um just before before we had the phone call i was looking back at jmac who was this um this guy who was he was the uh, he was the mascot of a basketball team, a high school basketball team, and the coach gave him the last four minutes of the last game in the season. To play, and in those four minutes to play, yeah, uh, mm. uh, he never, you know, he he was really into basketball, but he used to, you know, bring people towels and wipe oh, up yeah, yeah. sweat off the floor and stuff. And in these four minutes, you know, he he shot six three pointers, and um, he describes it's quite interesting. He like describes he shot how, and scored three pointers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he shot and uh. scored them. Yeah. And um, he describes how, how the basket became massive in his mind or massive in his eye. Like a, he describes it as a big old bucket that was huh. huge. And what, another thing that's interesting about autists is that the way they, um, the visual cortex is much more uh, developed than other people. Right. The visual, so, okay. The visual cortex, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they, what they will see, um, some autists uh, obviously can't see. So you get some quite spectacular musicians uh, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can't see. But um, but this thing about warping warping what we see that happens to uh, neurotypical people as well. A good example of it is if you have a gun pointed at you, if you're in a holdup, mm -hmm. and yeah. then you're interviewed afterwards. Everybody, practically everybody in that situation, will say the gun was bigger than it actually is. Uh, and they'll also say that people who are nearby, maybe two meters away, were actually five meters away, hmm. because we warp the entire visual scene. Uh, you're hyper focused what, on the danger. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So we're doing this the whole time. Another example is if you point to a uh, a slope, a hill in the distance, and you ask a young person what the what the angle of the slope is, <laughs> they're more likely to underestimate it. Whereas if you point to an old person, if, if you <laughs> do the same with an old person right. or uh, an unfit person, they're more likely to overestimate That's it. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. If you point to that slope to a young fit person, but they're carrying a heavy bag, hmm. they're also over likely to overestimate it. Right. So oh, we're, that's funny. we're constantly warping this world. And this is kind of goes back to why I, what I was really interested uh, in why people believe certain things. Mm. Also, why people, why people see certain things, why they miss certain things. Um, right. What's going on in our head, whether that's language, whether that's fear, whether that's psychedelics mm. uh, yeah. or a whole host of other things, you know, can, uh, various kind of atypical neuro conditions, which make us perceive the world differently. Is also Yeah really really interesting <laughs> yeah i mean it, the whole thing reminds me of um another example someone had used that when a, a when you're walking with a child say down a street a young ch a young child the child will look at every house you pass and notice all the details of the there might be a dog out front there might be a blue door there might be this whereas we have these categories as adults because we've seen so many houses we're not gonna we can't waste our time and energy looking at every single house anymore so we just kind of group them into categories and we just see houses we just see these these like blocks that aren't really, we don't see the details anymore. 
But when you're when you're young, you see that more. You see the details and things. Yeah, indeed. I mean, no, like, you see sim- something similar. Um, I'm I'm particularly non visual person. I remember with my uh, hmm. with my ex wife. I remember not noticing that she'd had a haircut. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> because... pretty... <laughs> yeah. I've done that one or two I... times. Yeah. I know. It's like, well, you've just you just got married, man. You've got to watch out for that. I know. But, be um, <laughs> you know, you've already kind of categorized someone. You see the same, you know, people can have their eyebrows shaved off and then they look in the mirror in the morning and they won't spot the fact they've got their eyebrows shaved <laughs> off because they've already they've already looked so many they times. They don't look. They've, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You just kind of glance. You kind of you just see it's your face. I want to show you a bit of my book, actually, which kind of uh, speaks to this um, particular story. Just give me a second there. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, while you're looking, I could even just one more example I remember was um, talking about language and um, there was one you don't have to like give more detail on this, but it was just like a, some group of people that didn't have a word for uh, blue, I think. And then when you're people were asking them to pick out a, a, a blue in a spectrum of greens and things, they had much harder time pinpointing that color because they just didn't yeah. have that reference point already. Yeah, it's the Himsa tribe, but they've got different words for green. So they'll spot a green that we right. Spot. So they could see way more uh, variations of green than other people could. Uh, yeah, and um, Russians have got two different words for blue. They've got a dark blue and a light blue, and they can they can tell variations. Ah, uh, yeah, of, yeah. Uh, of blue better than um, English speakers. Yeah, it's kind of um, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing, really. This is what I want to show you. I you can see that. But, yeah. Um, what that says, what that people tend to read that as, please keep off the grass. Yeah. Um, but if you look very carefully, it actually says, let me see if I can do this. Please keep off the, the oh, grass. I did not notice that. I didn't even yeah, see that. Almost no one notices it because you look at it, you read the first couple of letters, read the first couple of and words. And then you just and you skip go, oh. to the last bit. Yeah. Exactly. So that's how it works. Now, autists are much less likely to, uh, mm. for, and, and, and interestingly enough, if you, if you stimulate certain parts of the brain with transcranial stimulation, um, then people are more likely to spot those kind of tricks, and they also mm. become better at drawing. Like there's quite interesting um, mm. uh, uh, images of people who've tried to draw a dog before and during and after uh, certain, you know, um, inhibiting certain parts of the brain. Inhibiting and parts. It's, huh. okay. Yeah, inhibiting because it's it's the temporal lobe which is which is which does the categorizing, it does the, okay. the the association cortex, right? Yeah. So if you inhibit the certain parts of the association cortex, those categories don't really kick in quite so, quite so, uh, quite so clearly. So you so, might see more. You might uh, draw more detail in a dog then. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Um, and people do, and they also describe how. Having learned how to draw a dog, it kind of stays with them after the right. um, yeah after the simulation's finished. So there's other ways of getting to these getting to these places. Another one was with um, with psilocybin, obviously. You know, yeah, that so also... I, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask yes. before you go into that. How do you um, inhibit uh, certain parts of the brain? Oh, you you pass a magnetic uh, field through it, so you mm. you basically um, you put someone's head in a machine, and with the rest of their body, and they can pinpoint to... certain areas and just yeah. Wow, yeah, that is, can... is that not dangerous for a person? <laughs> um, you know, there's actually kits that you can buy, so you can buy them off the internet, and you can start doing it to yourself. Oh my god, is, people uh, don't do that. Don't people uh, do do that? Don't no, do I that. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds crazy. So I didn't. Re- so you can. Because that is something in uh, psychedelic research, like with psilocybin, I think with LSD, is they've they've seen that um, what when you're ingesting these things, they're actually inhibiting certain parts of the brain, and then other parts of the brain are connecting that weren't normally connecting. Yeah, exactly. So with the psilocybin research, um, actually, it was my brain in some of the psilocybin research. I sat in one of those. Is that right? Um, one of those things, yeah, and they kind of made me. Um, maybe tap buttons. Oh, that's neat. Uh, so you, you, were, you took psilocybin and were studied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the imperial research. Hmm. Um, so what happens with, with the psilocybin they found is that it inhibits um, connector hubs in the brain, hmm. uh, the bits which integrate different uh, sensory input and also uh, input from other places like memory and things like that. So a good example of that uh, would be synesthesia, which is something uh, that often happens when you're tripping. Yeah. Uh, and so in other situations, um, because you've got some bit of information, you've got part of your brain, which is saying it's a sound. 
and you've got another part of your brain which is uh um uh, which is kind of getting mixed up with it so so synesthesia is usually the mix is a uh, seeing sounds right and the visual cortex will get affected in a way that it shouldn't really be. Well, that's just like what you described with the one fella who heard, um, was it Mozart or, or something then the, and, and the dun, 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 dun. And he, he visualized that as dot, 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 dash. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly that. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting. If you look at the, 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 the map of, uh, how, uh, how neurons and how uh, different centers of the brain uh, connect while people are on psilocybin. Mm. It's um, it's a very distributed network. Um, mm-hmm. Robin Carhart Harris, who was doing some of the research, he used a very interesting metaphor to describe it. He says, um, "What would happen if you if you bombed the capital city? If you wiped out the capital city of a country?" Mm. And he said, "Well, there'd be a lot of confusion. There'd be a lot of chaos." And then links would be made through between different cities as they started to trade with each other and they um, uh, you know, develop yes, their own yes. networks. Right. So you get different things bits of the brain which aren't. Yeah, yeah. And they go into phase. So you get you get um, parts of the brain which are not normally in phase going into phase. Hmm. So you might have memories coming back, um, right. which 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 would be comp- compartmentalized. You might see something when you're, let's say, tripping in the woods, hmm. which might trigger a certain memory. Hmm. Because of some, let's say, some signature, some aspect of it, which reminds you. Right. Uh, so we get. Much you can more see how that thing, stuff like that happens. Like uh, even just looking at like mm-hmm. smells and how smells seem so linked to um, memories as well, and that it just it's just linked for some reason. It just a connection is made faster. It's the deepest part of your brain. Uh, the uh, or rather of all the senses, they go they go mm. right the deepest, like physically into your brain. That's smells. funny. That's so. I wonder, like, I wonder why it's it's interesting. Well, here's something else interesting. I mean, m- m- most of the time we're thinking about um, perception and sight, and occasionally in hearing. But even when you're hungry, right, mm-hmm. uh, your stomach produces something called ghrelin, which is a which is a hormone, mm. and it makes you more likely to notice the uh, smells. It makes basically makes your smell uh, more yeah more accurate. And it also in rats, it makes it makes them do more what's called exploratory sniffing, which is when they kind of. <laughs> Yeah, and it's all and in humans, it's linked to. If I remember this correctly, it's linked to adrenaline, which is more likely to make you get up and go and wander near the kitchen Find where you might. Find food. <laughs> that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we we kind of think of ourselves as autonomous, and on some level, we may be autonomous, but we're also constantly uh, reacting mm. to all kinds of external and internal internal. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Modulation of stimulus. Right. Yeah, for sure. We have this idea that we're like so um, we're so in charge of ourselves, but we're <laughs> really we're operating on so much habit and so much and not just habit, but all these things that trigger certain senses, hormones, different perceptions that lead us to do certain things. It's interesting. So maybe this is a good point probably to jump into um, the biblical psychedelic drug sort of talk. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, so Let's see. One of the things that's kind of clear um, from looking at it a bit and reading what uh, your book is like, it's you could definitely say at the very least there are a number of substances in the Bible, but it seems like many of them are, are fairly um, low level, maybe like small sedatives or thing in incense and things that people are using um, with small effects. But the big question and things what people are so interested in is this idea of like powerful psychedelics actually being in major parts of of the the biblical stories when it comes to people reporting visions and and communication with uh, god or angels and things so do you think that is that is the case in in some areas yeah there's it's, it's there's quite a lot to unpack there yeah right? um so this is the last question um the visitations of gods god names uh angels um the extraordinary experiences in the bible um i don't think many of those were triggered by um by substances uh when you're looking in the book of daniel or um job or um who else have we got uh enoch for example mm. um those those experiences of the angels and um so on and so forth i think they were triggered by well some of them are triggered by certain uh, holding certain postures some of them are triggered by sadness which mm. is quite an interesting one 
because um, if you stress rats, hmm. then the amount of 5-MeO DMT in their brains increases. Actually, stress increases the amount of endogenous DMT in our bodies. Really? Um, so that yeah. sort of speaks to people putting themselves in uh, states of high stress, maybe fasting or things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, lack of sleep as well that will trigger um, or extreme things. darkness. So, I've heard as well. Yeah, so uh, Strassman looks at these, and um, he's got a bit of a different uh, perspective on it to me. But certainly in terms of the profits, uh, it doesn't look like they're using any any psychoactive. So I wouldn't want to reduce all of the experiences right. of um, the weird or the other in the Bible to um, psychoactive experiences. Right. Um, where you do find those substances is in the tabernacle. Uh, which the Israelite priests were privy to. They were allowed into it. No one else was allowed in. And in the tabernacle, all kinds of things happened. So, so you had... can you explain what is the tabernacle? Tabernacle is a big tent, basically. It's described over five chapters of the Bible. Um, nothing else gets anything like that much detail in the Bible. Hmm. Uh, it's like the, you know, the story of Babel is over in half a chapter. This gets five <laughs> chapters, and Great. it's about... Um, uh, how the space between the hooks and how many hooks and what shape the frame is of this tent and what you hmm. the, the tent that's produced is um, I mean in simple modern terms it's a hot box right particularly yeah. the back end of it is a I think it's a four and a half meter cubed chamber which has it has a frame around it acacia frame funnily enough acacia being um, the highest concentration of DMT in the whole region a but anyway acacia it's made of, is a tree. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a number of trees. It looks like it's a Casia Sayal that was the uh, that was the one. Right. These trees that contain with. high amounts of DMT. Yeah, but there's nothing in the Bible about those uh, about DMT being uh, being used. There's some. There's Benny Shannon had a speculative hypothesis about an ayahuasca analog. But I don't, you don't need to speculate. Actually, there's there's already plenty in the Bible. So you've got this hot box, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the frame, and then you've got two skins pulled tight around it, and then you've got two other skins which which acts as a windbreak hmm. and it makes a um one of the skins is a is a very thick leather that was made to made to um used to make shoes as well so it's a, hmm. it's, a, it's a it's a kind of um it seems to be a, an impermeable leather Quite and thick. then it's it's sealed with a veil at the back now the veil is described at least in times of the the Roman temple uh, um sorry in the times of the of the Jewish temple it's described as very thick in fact the thickness of a uh, the breadth of a man's hand hmm. which means it's not it's not like a normal veil like the 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 exit of the tabernacle has a normal veil but then you've got this kind of special chamber in the back hmm. which has this thick veil okay which is a smoke trap and hmm. what happens in there is the high priest goes in there alone and burns huge amounts of incense, like hmm. um, handfuls of incense, finely ground incense. And the, the incense has got about 16 ingredients. Uh, now I'll tell this, you what they right are. Right here, can I just ask, is, is this idea, even without getting into any of the psychedelic stuff yet, just this huge amount of incense that the high priest would go in and use, is that debated at all? Or is that no. pretty... No. that They were definitely uh, doing that. That's God's word, that is. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, no, Can't argue with that, that. though. And also the chemicals in there are not debated. I mean, there's a little bit of um, discussion over uh, which which kind of uh, Boswellia tree uh, mm -hmm. the 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 frankincense might be, uh, for example. Um, but no, it's um, the substances are well known. There's one which is um, let's say more speculative, which is something called Canebosum mm. or Canebosem, which uh, it's in the time of the Talmud, which is a later book. It's become fused into one word, which is cannabis, and it's uh, sounds like cannabis. I mean, it, well, it is cannabis basically. <laughs> if you look at linguistic evidence and a whole lot of other evidence, every single tribe around the Israelites uh, had a word for it, and they were using it. And the Scythians, for example, <laughs> it was really were visited. Common, then. Yeah, it was really common. It was found the Scythians were visited by Herodotus in about the fifth or sixth century BC, and he mm. describes them throwing cannabis. He describes them like um. Uh, folding down the flaps of the tent mm. and then making a fire and then throwing cannabis on the fire and then everyone jumping up and singing for joy. <laughs> and, and he actually says it, it exceeds any Grecian vapor bath. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and so, so you've got it there, you've got it in down in Egypt um, as well. It was found in uh, Ramesses II's mummy and you've got archaeological finds of cannabis both uh, used topically and uh, used as a smoke mm. in, uh, in Israelite territory itself. So uh, there's no doubt that it was used there, and there's you know there's still some people who will argue uh, argue whether cannabosum is, I mean, what it's traditionally translated, it's normally translated as calamus, 
mm. which doesn't fit at all. Canemus is a reed, and we know that Cane Bossum was used to make uh, shirts for the dead, and you uh, can't make shirts out of reeds because it, it will decompose right. pretty much. Whereas immediately. hemp is very good for making clothing. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so we have one kind of line of inquiry is around the hemp. Um, that's not in the that's in the anointing oil, which was put upon the priests in a massage. Mm. In fact, it's called shemen hamishcha, and the word mishcha comes from uh, masha, which is to wipe or to paint or to massage. It. Mm. Uh, some people think that it's where we get the word massage from. Masha mm. uh, becomes the word massage. So there's a massage oil which contained uh, four ingredients. That was um, cannabis, myrrh cinnamon and cassia right hmm. um maybe i'll just tell you a little bit about them because it's quite interesting sure um and a little bit complex you've got um an enzyme system the cytochrome system in the body it's got 57 different enzymes uh they're called the p450 enzymes and they will call things like cyp d26 and cyp 2a1 right now so you've got 57 of them uh five of them are involved in 90 percent of uh drug metabolism so mm. whether you take MDMA, whether you take steroids, whether you take whatever it is, it's mm -hmm. pretty much all of it is broken down by five enzymes. And four of those enzymes are inhibited by cinnamon. Really? Right? Yeah. Um, the fifth one, which is not inhibited by cinnamon, is inhibited by cassia, which is another, another form of cinnamon. The cinnamon that you oh. get in the shops is quite often cassia. Oh. Uh, they call it Chinese cinnamon. It's used in Chinese medicine. Um, so the, the, my... Uh, psychoactive uh, studies um, by the end of the year, this is uh, this will be coming out, is that the the combination of uh, essential oils or of oils in the anointing oil that was put upon the priest, which was wiped all over them, mm. well, we know that it's got all kinds of quite interesting and powerful psychedelics in it. It's got estrogen, it's got eugenol, um, it's got uh, elemesin, it's got all the stuff, a lot of the stuff that's in nutmeg, right? Mm. Now, nutmeg can be a really powerful psychedelic uh, because it's got both allyl benzenes, it's got these powerful psychedelic chemicals in it, but it's also got inhibitors which inhibit your enzymes so you don't break down those mm. chemicals before they get to your brain. Right. And that makes sense. So, right? I, was, so I was a little bit confused talking about the cinnamon and how it can, um, is it, does it work where, like if I were to use a bunch of cinnamon and then use uh say like mdma or, or something or dr would would it inhibit me from that from it from the mdma taking effect or would it increase the effect i was confused there. Uh, mda um or is that even a good example think about no 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 it's a good example um it would inhibit it inhibits the enzymes which break down drugs right um, break down as in so break down in the way like you'd break it down and and not it wouldn't have effect yeah, exactly. So uh, they're in your, so they're in your, um, in your gut, in your liver, in your skin. You've got enzymes. So, so it, it um, would increase the effect then of these things. Well, of MDMA, I'm not sure, but of MDA-like compounds, mm. which you've got in the, uh, um, which you've got in the anointing oil, I'll just find out exactly what they are. Mm. So um, it's a little similar, to, you could say, to the ayahuasca brew with the um, <laughs> MAOI, which is. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Allows so, allows so, the DMT to take effect. Yeah, that's right. So you've got um let me just see if I can find them. Uh M D M uh, A. Um Estrogel, Eugenol, LMSN, and Safrol, mm. right? They're all in the oil which is put on uh priests and kings, right? Safrol is what you make MDMA out of normally. It's mm. the it's the it's the raw okay. material for it. Right now, unlike I mean, MDMA is particularly special because it because it um, it doesn't get broken down in the body, or at least it takes a long time for it to be broken down in the body. So it gets to right. the brain and does all kinds of funky things. Right. Um, estradiol, lmsin, safrol, uh, these things they they tend to get broken down uh, either into something completely inactive, or they get broken down to something which is mildly sedative. Okay, yeah? I see. Yeah. But if you've inhibited your enzymes, then no, it goes straight to your brain, and they also they also potentiates THC as well in myrrh which is one of the other ingredients you've got three different opioid uh, receptor agonists and obviously they have um both analgesic kind of painkilling effects but also uh, mood enhancing effects and mm -hmm. euphoric effects so are you saying and, that these pre if they they would use this oil that would contain these inhibitors and then they would go hot box <laughs> 
Yeah, well, only only the lucky high priest. So the uh. um, the other priests, they used the oil, mm. and then they got to eat something called showbread, which we don't really know what that is. I'll come back to that in a minute. But yeah, the high priest would use the oils, and then you go into the hotbox. Uh. So the stuff that he was hotboxing, he was already... It would have been doubly potent for him because his inhibitory system was also oh, inhibited. Oh, wow, wow, okay. You know, plus he just totally oiled himself up with cannabis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so then you've got the showbread as well, right? Um, I'm going to find you a nice little quote for that. The, the showbread, um, there's a book called A Guide to the Perplexed it's by Maimonides, and he is, he's describing all of the different, various different aspects of, of Jewish culture. And he gets as far as the showbread, and he says, I don't know. Uh, he says, this is a complete enigma. Uh, we don't know what this is about at all. Hmm. So um, there's a quite interesting little um, bit of text I'm going to read. This is from the Talmud, right? Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can find it for you. So the showbread is what they eat on their own. Okay, I'm going to read it. Um, so this is what the this is what the normal priests eat after they've been oiled up. Right? Okay. In high priest Simeon the upright's time, every piece every priest who received only the size of an olive became satiated, and some was left over. Hmm. But after these thing after him these things were cursed, and every priest got only the size of a bean. And the delicate priest refused to take it altogether, but the voracious ones accepted and consumed. Hmm. It once happened. One took his own share and his fellows. He was nicknamed robber till his death. Right. So we're talking about super tiny doses yeah, yeah. Small of this bread. You know, you've got one you've got one high priest who makes it better than others, mm. which is also quite interesting. From yeah, kind of right, right. And then you've got some priests who, who find it Moorish. You know, they're going after more and they're then called they're kind of nicknamed robber. And then you've got other ones for whom it's all it's a little bit too much, which mm. you can also imagine. Yeah, that all that speaks to very uh, well. more than just some. So is this uh, like the interpretation in, in like standard interpretations of, of the Bible and things? Are people just interpreting this as bread, just food? Well, that's what I mean, my um, monitor says, I don't know. Mm. You know, and he's one of the greatest sages of all time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. But it's just just the doses are, make it kind of very difficult. It doesn't to make a lot of sense, that. does it? And why would they oil up and then go eat a loaf of bread, like tiny, tiny crumb of bread? It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, does it? <laughs> <laughs> unless you're unless you're very very high so yeah. um one of the things that's quite i think quite fascinating um uh, about uh, i mean come back to the category and how the category uh obscures the detail you know you get people who are textual scholars you get people who are biblical scholars who know absolutely nothing about mm. um psychopharmacology and you get right. psychopharmacology who know nothing about the bible uh, yeah um, yeah I'm a, I know a little bit about both. And, you know, it's, it's not very complicated. I mean, frankincense, you've got, we've got the list of the ingredients. We've got frankincense, right? We know that frankincense, you can just look up, um, look up the psychopharmacology of it. We know it's got incense or acetate and it's mm. got dehydroabiatic acid. And we know that um, one of those is a GABA receptor agonist. It works in the GABA receptors. It tranquilizes you. And we know the other one works on the TRPV3 ion channels, which is distributed in the skin and is involved in temperature sensation and it's also distributed in the brain where we know nothing about it we don't know what it does in the brain but we do know that frankincense was carried you know 3000 bc they were already taking frankincense all the way from like uh, oman through 1500 miles of robber infested <laughs> deserts right. all the way so the pharaoh yeah. burn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, so, so the idea uh, pff, I mean, one of one of the Pope's uh, favorite theologists, he talks about this pr prodigious waste of of a precious material and what a beautiful symbolism this is. It's complete nonsense. I mean, mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, we know that it, it acts as a tranquilizer. We also know, actually, from Persian medicine, that cinnamon was used as what they call a convoy medicine. So we, we know that if you were treating a liver problem, you'd give someone a, a certain thing for the liver, but you'd also give them cin cinnamon mm -hmm. because it aids. Um, absorption right. of the other drug and the reason Abe's absorption of the other drug is because it inhibits the enzymes right uh which would otherwise so you know we kind of have a um yeah they know like they they we we know that they would have known about these properties of these things well i mean you'd like i mean that'd be nice wouldn't it but i i think it's kind of um i think we just kind of assume that the ancients were just f fumbling around with trial and error mm. and not really getting anywhere. And if you compare it to our own medicine, like if you look at like an indigenous Amazonian medicine, for example, mm -hmm. where they were using monoamine oxidase inhibition for, you know, several hundred years at least yeah, right. to make ayahuasca, 
right? We didn't we didn't develop in in the West. We didn't discover monoamine oxidase inhibition until I think in uh, the forties. It was right. discovered by mistake, um, <laughs> yeah. and it was and and what have we done with it? You know, we've made antidepressants, which are uh, they're thought to be slightly more um, slightly better than placebo at treating depression. Mm. You know. Um, and, and and over in the jungle, they made ayahuasca. Um, <laughs> right. and they made it hundreds so, of years ago, you know. And they didn't have all uh, this the scientific method and all this stuff. So, you know, I, I met I met um, Doctor uh, so Professor Nutt, who was the yeah, uh, advisory council. Yeah, that guy. So um, he told me that every single class of psychiatric drugs was discovered by mistake. <laughs> right. So right. nitrous oxide was also discovered by mistake. Acid was discovered by mistake. Uh, but yeah, everything, all of them, lithium. Uh, right. So we have this idea that, 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 you know, the ancients, the Amazonians are bumbling around with, um, trial and error. You know, we, we know for sure that we're doing it by trial and error. Well, not even by trial and error, by error generally. Yeah. 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 It just happened. To, yeah. And so it's very, so what you're saying is it's very, very possible. It's just very unlikely probably that they, they were able to figure this out by testing these different <laughs> herbs and things. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, testing, or perhaps well, what 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 the indigenous people would say in the Amazon was that the plants told them, right? Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you can <laughs> speak to some divine, or um, yeah. Well, so let's go to um, you're talking about what the uh, the the lower priests were using, but um, is it then um, is it come to this idea of manna that the high priest is then using, um, or is that a different? Well, is that not the same um, situation after rubbing down the oil and and all that? Well, that's no. Hamana comes into it as well. So the pulled up with myrrh, with its opium, uh, with its uh, opioid receptor agonist, uh, cannabosum, which looks like cannabis, and then, the, and then cinnamon and cassia, which are inhibitors. Um, and then he goes off into the uh, into the smoke box mm -hmm. and uses a mixture of of things like spikenard, for example. Spikenard is interesting. It's the stuff that Jesus's feet are oiled with. And Judas complains. They say, "Why are we using this expensive stuff mm. on Jesus's feet?" Right? Spikenard boosts uh, serotonin. It boosts GABA, mm. uh, and it boosts dopamine, and it, it assists in memory formation. Right? Wow. So, uh, in, in rats, I think it makes them um, remember how um, uh, how to get through mazes. And better, if you were right? to rub that onto your feet, you would absorb it effectively that way. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean they they rubbed it all over their body, but yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a whole there's, in, in Chinese medicine you get kind of foot baths and stuff like that. Mm, um, yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a common way of of using medicines. But then you've also you've got other ingredients. You've got like myrrh. You've got frankincense. You've got um, what else? Uh, a couple of different types of myrrh. Um, then you've got um, gosh, it's all slipped my mind now. What else have you got? Would in it there? be? Uh, are, you, are you also? putting throwing dmt into the mix um no well that's an interesting question right so what you've got in there is um um you've got something called agar wood which is oud uh in arabic and that's got a loads and loads of stuff in it i have heard um i haven't found it published but i have heard that they have also found dmt in uh, in agar wood hmm. So the, the the resins which are in which are listed in the Talmud, which are in the smoke incense, is myrrh, cassia, cinnamon, spikenard, saffron, which is where you get saffron from, and uh, also uh, saffronal. Um, saffron's interesting stuff. It was it was in the Islamic tradition. It's described as one of the drugs which causes joy, right? So it's not mm. prohibited in uh, in Islam, and the effect of it is said to be like opium. Um, mm. Costus, sassarea costus. Uh, agar wood and uh, mastic. So you've got all of those, all of those things going into the That's smoke. A lot, a lot of, stuff. of them, yeah. So some of them are nootropic. It means they help your memory. Some of them are um, sedatives, um, tranquilizers. We, we, sometimes, you know, again, the category when we when we call something a tranquilizer, we might think, oh, it makes you tranquil. Right. Um, tranquilizers could do some extraordinary. You know, opium is a tranquilizer because that can do some extraordinary things to your mind. Right. So. Um, yeah, the nomenclature can kind of get in the way a little bit when we're thinking about them. Yeah, for sure. Well, even what was it? Uh, was it ketamine? It was a tranquilizer as well? Was that was... Yeah. Yeah, and that it's can, you know, that's a full-on, full yeah, full-on experience to take something like that. Yeah, they weren't using that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, what's, what's also quite interesting about it is that, um, so that mixture is also very similar to kiffy, which was a, 
incense used in um, Egyptian temples as well. And it seems that there's some kind of line of transmission of knowledge between Egypt and Israel. Because the oil itself, right, the Egyptians made an oil with uh, myrrh, cinnamon and cassia in it. It was called the Mendesium and it was exported actually from the Bronze Age mm. to um, uh, outside of Egypt. And then the, you know, thousand odd years later, the Israelites turn up using the same mix of myrrh, cinnamon, cassia, mm, and also right. putting tenebos into it as well. So there seems to be some kind of line of uh, transmission of right. arcane. So, you know, when, the, so going back to the, the high priest and going into basically hot box, I mean, for one, were they hot boxing because they, did they have pipes then or no? No. No, they didn't have, okay. So that makes sense. So that's how they, that's how they could inhale this stuff is just by lighting a big fire with it and getting it going, like getting a whole room going with it. Um, yeah. So, what would be the perp? What was the high, high priest's purpose at this time to use? What What would he then um, come out with afterward? What was sort of the purpose of this prophecy? Hmm, he'd come out with a idea. prophecy. Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, you get this in in other smoke tent or smoke box traditions. So, for example, the oracle at Delphi, the oracle at uh, Delphi, uh, yeah. used to burn uh, laurel and henbane and myrrh, uh, some of the same um, some of the same chemicals in a cave right and then she'd come out with prophecy right and right so so yeah it was about divination um and uh which is quite interesting i think especially the neurotropics that are in there the stuff that help you form memories could you imagine it you're mm. really really mashed and you're getting all this kind of information <laughs> right and, and then, then you've got to try and remember it yeah right <laughs> you know that's a really interesting idea actually yeah especially with you know especially think about it with with thc you know that can really uh mm -hmm. do a number on your short-term memory absolutely but yeah. there's um, there's things like um, some of the allobenzenes have been tested, and they uh, um, they reduce the they reduce the uh, the memory uh, let's say the the memory disruption of THC. I think it's acetylcholinase uh, um, inhibition. I can't remember the exact the exact details of it, but um, yeah, and this was like a this high priest going in and doing this was like a once a year sort of thing. Um, later on, yeah, later on, it's once a year. Mm -hmm. When Moses is doing it, he's kind of in the tent quite a lot because he was, they were doing active um, divination at the time. Traditionally, mm -hmm. um, in shamanic cultures, divination is used for diagnosing diseases, for example. Yeah. Um, both of collective and, and of, a, of an individual. It's also used for uh, finding access to game and to uh. water, for example, which Moses does both when he's... Um, when he's divining in the uh, okay, yeah, in the tabernacle, and it's also used for military military tactics. So you mm. know, in the um, actually, um, yeah, ayahuasca has been used as a as a weapon of war as well because you're kind of uh, with kind of heightened sensitivity, you can perhaps hear your enemy attacking, and if you have super heightened sensitivity, mm. you might be able to get into your enemy's mind and know when they're going to attack you, so you can go and attack them. I mean, people on ayahuasca have talked about. Uh going right out of their body and flying across the, the landscape. So, I mean, <laughs> you might be able to go get some intel or something. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You, yeah. I reckon DARPA are onto it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, okay. Well, I do want to... So okay. That actually reminds me of a question I want to ask. But first, um, I do want to get into the idea of mana then. and Because that's something you do write about it in the book and that you relate it to ergot. That it could so, be... Yeah. Yeah, so mana ends up in the tabernacle along with uh, everything else. And it ends up in actually in the high priest's bit of it. So no one else gets their hands on, on, on mana mm. uh, after, the, the, after the trip through the, the wilderness, right? Mana is described in, um, in the Bible as um, like coriander, white, like coriander seeds, white and resinous, right? Mm. Um, it's also described as like a frost on the ground. And those are the two formats in which you find ergot because ergot is a secretion. It drips out of the out of um, various plants and it either dries on the branch where it forms these little pellets. Because ergot is a fungus? Yeah, it's a fungus, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it appears uh, at the onset of spring, which is when the Israelites find their manna. Mm, okay. Um, it appears where you have vegetation. Um, and, and therefore water and the Israelites they don't find it when there's no water they only find it when it's water oh, okay. and then they find it in the format they, the taste of it is the same as manna manna is described as uh, having the taste of um, of honey and uh, got secretion does have the taste of honey hmm. and then what's really interesting is the preparation for it in the Bible is you um, you grind it and then you boil it uh, and then you bake it right and 
if you do that to ergot, what you do is you you separate out the insoluble uh, parts of it, which are the poison poisonous parts, oh, okay. and you get left with cr- basically crystals of uh, of something which contains LSA, which is a close cousin to LSD, right. and uh, a super powerful, uh, rather pleasant psychoactive. Hmm. So they would be able to extract that fairly <laughs> simply. Then it would like could, they, they're not actually making LSD as we know it, but something similar that can be extracted through a more of a primitive process. Yeah, so Hoffman himself, who was the first guy who who extracted LSD out of um, uh, ergot, he used mm-hmm. uh, he used ergot himself. Uh, he said that the process was very much uh, available to early man. Really? Hmm. It's easy. You just boil it, right? And, <laughs> okay, and well, bake that it. doesn't sound yeah. too complicated. And you grind it. So the grinding is interesting as well because you get other secretions in the in the desert. But most of them, like you get something called man, for example, which is a, a kind of it's a, it's a more gummy secretion, which is which is used as a food hmm. by Bedouins. But it's you know you can't grind it. So ergot also you, it's uh, it's brittle. You can grind it. So you're saying Moses was taking something like LSD in this tabernacle? Um, mo- there's not. I'm just wondering. I don't think there's a specific reference to him taking manna, but he's the guy who knows what manna is because oh, the okay. the the Israelites look at it and they say, um, is this, well, it's a bit complicated, but they say, well, they say something which could be translated as, what is this? But there's problems with that translation. Okay. They also, it also could be translated as, this is man, and man is a Bedouin word mm-hmm. for something else. And Moses goes, and, and the line goes like this, it says, they said, this is man because they wished not what it was, because they didn't know what it was, so uh, clearly they're wrong. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Moses says, Moses says um, this is the bread which, uh, which, um, which the Lord gives you. I think that's the line like that. So, so he knows that he word knows. bread again. They're using this word bread for these these things. Yeah. So I mean, I've heard bread uh, means... people people have written to me with the, in this. I think it must be from these same parts of these stories, and they're referring often to bread as psilocybin. That's something that people have written to me and, and talked to me about, and that's something that's been passed around a bit. But it seems like there maybe is more evidence that uh, like it's these things that you're describing. Uh, the, the mushroom thing, man. Um, Tom Hatzis has just um, it, it completely demolished that argument. As as, as far as I'm, um, th- there's not a single reference to it in the Bible. Like um, there's uh, it, it, in in Christian traditions later, you've got people quite openly talking about um, the various different um, psychoactives they're using, whether that's mandrake, whether that's cannabis. Um, I think hembane, you know, I, I, it's not really my field, but right. there's no reason why they would uh, hide the fact that they were using mushrooms. Mm. Right? It wasn't prohibited. It's not. Um, it's not. It's not something that was uh, that was unkosher. It's not like pork or something. In those days, early, just, uh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't prohibited then. So there's yeah. uh, the the evidence for mushrooms is like, you know, church windows with something that looks like a mushroom in it right um right. stuff like that so there, you know, and there may well have been later traditions which did incorporate mushrooms into it but there's clearly none there, there's there. no evidence you wouldn't it, translate that those these instances of talking about bread as that you yeah. you think yeah yeah something else okay no, so, bread, so who bread did use of... the, who did use this um this manna then who was actually documented <laughs> using it uh, the Israelites, they use it all together. They all take oh. it together. And one of the things that they see when they're taking it is um, uh, they have a synesthetic experience. So mm-hmm. when they're looking up at the mountain, they see the um, they see the thunder and the sounds of the trumpet. They mm-hmm. see the sounds of the trumpet, right? And it's the only example of synesthesia in the entire Bible. It's also the only example of a collective vision uh, in the Old Testament, right? Mm-hmm. And in fact... Very rarely in um, in scripture, like world scripture, yeah. do you get collective vision visions. You get you get individuals who see things, but you don't get a whole group of people. Right. So the only time you do get a whole group of people seeing synesthetic something at the same time is when they're taking manna. And that is something that's reported from people using LSD for sure. I've heard that directly. <laughs> oh, well, co- collective visions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People for, sharing for... an experience and synesthesia as well. Yeah, my my friend um, Andy Roberts, who's he's written some books on on acid. He was describing being at Glastonbury mm. and uh, a conversation between I think four people in a tent, all of whom were seeing a spaceship uh, <laughs> coming down and people coming out of the spaceship and this whole experience they oh, all had together. Yeah. So that's I mean that se- like okay, so that seems like pretty good evidence that that could have happened that these this group of people did use this ergot substance we've got 
in modern times, we've got a collective, uh, a mass apparition. In 1917, the, the Virgin Mary appeared at Fatima in Portugal, right? Mm. There were, I mean, there were no psychedelics involved, um, but th- literally thousands of people saw something, yeah. right? And it was the third, like, uh, it was announced. So there were reporters there, loads of reporters, and like thousands, I think even tens of thousands of people. And, you know, some people saw the sun dancing around the sky. Some people saw the sun getting bigger. Some mm. people saw light as if coming through a stained glass window. People saw really radically different things. Yeah. Because but, it was happening in their heads. Um, <laughs> but it was at the same time. But at the same time, yeah. And when I say that it was happening in the heads, I don't, that doesn't mean to say that it wasn't happening outside the heads as well. Mm. Um, I wouldn't want to reduce the gods to um, experiences in our heads. In our heads. But right. I think... Uh, certain techniques certain technologies certain psychedelics um give us access to uh seeing them same way you know if i take off my glasses Mm -hmm. and you kind of go a bit out of focus if i put my glasses again there you're in focus again yeah doesn't mean to say you're not there yeah and just what we were talking about but i mean it kind of relates to our the start of our conversation talking about how people just how our brain our brains really do create our reality and, and and our language and all these other things but that it's we're all interpreting what's going on around us in our minds. So you can say we see it in our minds in a way, but we're all, that's how we're interpreting the world outside as well. So it's all kind of the same, really. Yeah, they say seeing is believing, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. which is kind of scary. I've seen all kinds of crazy things in my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I couldn't trust that. So the other thing that I wanted to get to mm-hmm. after talking about um, this, like if it's true that they that these whether it's the high priest or this group of people that use this stuff and especially the high priest situation where they're using it continuously for purpose um do you think then that like there is there some sort of conspiracy at some level in uh, high levels of the church that they maybe <clears throat> knew about this that they know about it now or has it been kind of forgotten and dismissed without a sort of uh, conspiratorial twist <laughs> yeah, interesting. There's a guy called Dan Merker who wrote a book, uh, I think it's called The Mystery of Manor, and he traces through the Talmud and later Christian writings um, cryptographical um, references which he interprets as uh, the continuation of the knowledge about manna hmm. being ergot, right? Um, I don't know enough about the Talmud to be able to um, decide either way if he's just um, if he's just finding it or if it's actually there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's certainly kind of plenty of speculation that the knowledge stayed alive. Um, whether there's a conspiracy or not, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. No right? idea. I mean, I uh, like I spoke to someone named Kalindi E. Have you heard of him? Yeah, he's quite into his conspiracies. Yeah, 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 for sure. And he's into the very high doses of psilocybin. But it's his opinion yeah. that there is a conspiracy, that he believes the people in high levels in these organizations are using the stuff behind the scenes and not telling anyone. Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I met a guy in Brazil who had, <clears throat> he, you know, he was a Swiss guy uh, and a, uh, what do you call those guys um, who get, uh, he's a mercenary basically, that's what, he was, that's oh. what his job was oh, wow. um, okay. <laughs> before, before, before I knew him. Yeah. Um, he had a change of heart when he got into ayahuasca, oh, that's nice. but he was training in uh, the Bolivian jungle with ayahuasca. No, they were, they, were, they were using it. Yeah, training. I'm not. He didn't really go into exactly what the training was, but he said it's an amazing weapon of war. No way, Merc- yeah, like so, a, a mercenary training incorporated ayahuasca. Uh, yeah, that's what he told me. Wow. Um, and I've got no reason to uh, to disbelieve him. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm. Uh, yeah, I mean the the. Like we've had forty years of, of really good research on cannabis uh, being being harmless, basically, mm. uh, yeah. and England, England in particular, is really, really, is very complicated about changing that rule. You know, the, the things seem to be changing at the moment. Yeah, nothing to do with the science. It's because it's because um, it's because uh, I don't know if you heard the story about um, Billy, the autistic kid, who was having. Uh, uh, really, really bad epileptic seizures, hundreds uh, of them a day. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And someone, Charlotte Caldwell, his mum, went to Canada and brought back some oil from mm. there, declared it at customs, uh, got it taken off her, and then there was this national outcry, and yeah. it looks like we may get a little bit of movement in the law. But basically, that was nothing to do with science, uh, nothing yeah. to do with logic or reason Public or anything. Public outcry. Was, 
<laughs> yeah, public outcry, which is the only thing that the British government are, uh, are interested in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, changing soon in Canada, which is exciting. Uh, next month, it should be happening. Hopefully, cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there seems to be... Um, yeah, I mean, then, then you, you're going to have a whole lot of uh, companies are going to be fighting over it as well. I mean, there's yeah, there's going to be that. There's going to be the whole business side sides. and and all that. I'm very excited though, just to see that it's actually something's changing, and that will yeah. hopefully uh, snowball into further change too. And maybe something like mushrooms could be could be next or something. I think the cat's out of the bag, really. Um, yeah. So I'd be surprised if we have another. I mean, you never know. We've got kind of rising fascists all over the world, so maybe it will it will be stuffed back into the tabernacle again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I like, I like to hope that some things are changing. Yeah. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. You really know your stuff. Like once you get into it, you know, you, you've been doing a lot of research. I mean, your book is uh, chock full of, of information too. You've obviously been uh, working. You know, it's not a not an easy process writing a book like that. Uh, thanks very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I've got the the first one is this one, the Science Revealed. That's currently out of print, mm. uh, but I'm just um, um, it has some copyright violations is, and is stuff. The, so I'm just uh, <laughs> is that uh, <laughs> on, on similar topics as well? Uh, that's about the history of uh, history of science. Particularly, I'm looking at so all my books. That one, those two, and the one I haven't written yet are about um, the apocalypse on some level, revelation, right. uh, something hidden being revealed. So that book there, that red book, Science Revealed, is about uh, scientists who've discovered things when they're uh, just waking up, or in flashes of inspiration, oh, or on psychedelics, um, looking at Tesla's visions and Mendeleev. Right, and which is what you were sort of, of talking about uh, at the beginning of the conversation for yourself too. That's how things kind of appear. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So that one, and then uh, so looking at how scientific journals uh, massage, uh, you know, like what gets published, what doesn't get published, what gets funded, mm. uh, how reality is maintained on a more societal level. And the second book's more about neurobiology and linguistics of it. And right. the third book, which will come out one of these days, um, is about c moments in history where you have lots and lots of, um, new worlds discovered so looking at for example when the microscope was discovered and the telescope and uh, what it did new, to uh, new like i see yeah that's that is interesting yeah opens up a whole new dimension sort of yeah and tends to leave great a great big body count in the uh, uh right. in its wake as well cool well is there also like a way do you have a website or something that people if they want to get a hold of you or see more of your your work or yeah, I've got a website which is um, www.nemusend, n e m u s e n d dot co dot uk. Mm. There's a load of talks on there um, and articles and stuff. Um, like I said, I've got this JPS article coming out at the end of the year. There's Psychedelic Press, uh, Cypress UK, uh, which has also got uh, my publisher, and they've got a bunch of my stuff as well. Uh, what else? A recent talk I gave for. Um, Beyond Psychedelics oh, yeah. has been published online as well. That's about neocolonialism um, uh, in the study of the academic study of ayahuasca. So that's one to look up. I'm quite pleased with that one, actually. So look yeah, up cool. Beyond Psychedelics and Neocolonialism and Nemu and you'll find me. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks a lot, Danny. I really enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, me too. Thanks a lot, Carl. Appreciate it.